and ecology. And he gets to regularly go on trips to uh, Antarctica, where he goes on helicopters with pop stars that he never recognizes, um, which is one of my favorite facts about Arvind. Um, more importantly than that, he is a mountaineer, a rock climber, and he's a father to two of the most beautiful cats I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I'm sure. Oh, wow. Shut it down. Um, Arvind is almost superhumanly productive. He has just under 1 billion publications on his CV. Um, but more importantly, Arvind is also almost superhumanly kind. He's one of my favorite collaborators um, to work with. He's uh, he's incredibly productive and brilliant, but he is patient and he's curious and he's excited uh, and he's just one of the best collaborators I've ever had. So I hope that all of you can eventually have or be a collaborator like Arvind. Um, and with that, I'll let you take it away. You're here. Come on. Wow. Thank you, India. Now that the opening act is that good, like, you know, the second act or the main act is probably going to be like <laughs> down there. Anyway, so what I thought today I'd do is kind of take you on a little bit of a journey and kind of dabble in a different group of viruses and kind of give you little snippets of information that kind of builds issues of and concepts of evolution around the board. Now, one of the important things when we think about viruses is they actually debunk central dogma because the genomic elements are not always double-stranded. They can come in a variety of different flavors. They can be single-stranded DNA. And everyone's like, wow, single-stranded DNA, why is that possible? Because we know double-stranded DNA is stable. Viruses do have single-stranded DNA. But on the flip side, we have viruses that have double-stranded RNA genomes, which is completely wacky because that kind of triggers all sorts of cellular responses to try and degrade that RNA because double-stranded RNA shouldn't be in cellular systems. And so you've got these really, really interesting dynamics of viruses that go in all sorts of different flavors. And even in RNA viruses, they can have different polarity, like a positive sense, which is equal to a messenger RNA, and a negative sense, which is complementary to a messenger RNA. So this changes the dynamic in the way we study viruses. But one of the things that is very important for us to think about is how we've studied viruses. And we've studied viruses from this very, very particular area here. We pick one virus that causes a particular disease in an organism that we dearly care about, and that's it. So we've got a very, very biased lens in the way we study viruses so far. And with that biased lens, there are issues in our public databases because that whole database is then biased to only disease-causing entities. Now, if all viruses were fatal, I say fatal, there would be no organisms on the planet because viruses infect each and every organism on the planet. So one of the more important things is for us to start thinking about viruses beyond just viruses and a particular disease, start thinking about the host interactions, which we do, because we're interested in immune responses. How do we modulate immune responses to uh, combat infectious viruses that come into a system and find a balance? But then a thing that we don't look at is virus-virus interactions. What happens if there is a co-infection? Is that a product that results in a more severe disease outcome? Or is it counterintuitive where one virus modulates another and reduces the disease outcome in that uh, system? And then we can go beyond that and start thinking about viruses in a population structure, in a community, and their role in ecosystems. But also, what are the roles of viruses across the board, which we don't think about much, but the bacteriologists who study bacteriophages think about primarily because bacteriophages carry auxiliary metabolic genes. So they become accessories for the host with these additional genes that they are beneficial to the host. So this is where kind of some of the beneficial viruses come around. And perhaps the most amazing example is this situation here of a three-way symbiosis and this is a panic grass that grows in Yellowstone National Park at about 55 degrees centigrade, so that is pretty warm. And it is infected or colonized by a fungus, and the fungus is infected by a virus. Now, you take the virus away, the fungus very rapidly grows, kills the grass. You take the fungus away, away the grass doesn't grow. So the fungus is infected by a virus. That virus induces a thermal tolerance mechanism through the fungi into the grass. So there is this really, really unique 
switching on of certain genes that is taking place, and the virus modulates the growth rate of the fungi, a mechanism called hypervirulence. And this we see in nature as well. And so this is kind of really, really interesting. Start thinking about concepts of these things. Now, when we look at these viruses, obviously based on the genomes, they have completely different mechanisms of replication. And it wouldn't be surprising that a virus that has a positive sense RNA is gonna have a head start. As soon as it goes into a cell, it does not need to transcribe. It can start translating straight away. So it is in an infectious cycle much, much more rapidly. And a lot of the viruses that are highly pathogenic, we do see them in the single-stranded positive sense RNA modality. Now, beyond that, when we start looking at databases, and this is where our poorly populated databases come in, we start seeing heavy bias in terms of, say, archaea. We don't see many RNA viruses, whereas in bacteria, neither do we see that. Protists, we see a few. When you go to fungi, we see primarily RNA viruses, very few DNA viruses. And a lot of this is to do with the way we have characterized or studied viruses from this very, very much a biased lens. But when you study viruses, we need to think about the mechanisms of evolution of viruses. So viruses use a variety of mechanisms of evolution. The most common one we know about is nucleotide substitutions during replication. However, if there is a deleterious mutation that gets fixed in a genome, it is very, very difficult for this to repair primarily by mutation itself. But then viruses use this other mechanism of evolution. And this is when there is a co-infection in a cell, you get template hopping during two, between two copies of a virus genome that are related to each other. And through that, you generate chimeric molecules. And through this, you can explore fitness landscapes very, very rapidly and also fix deleterious mutations extremely quickly. And finally, we have viruses that are wacky. And these are examples are segmented viruses. You can think of them as viruses that have multiple cro chromosomes. And each chromosome encodes for one gene. So for example, influenza virus, there are eight segments. So you can think about them as eight chromosomes. They're linear RNA molecules, each one encoding for one gene. They all get encapsulated into one particle. So if you have a co-infection, you can get reassortment taking place, repackaging, and then with that, you get reassortants, and that's the main reason we get influenza vaccines every year, because there are reassortants taking place in reservoir species. Now, there are these are the groups of viruses called segmented viruses, and these are unique, where each and every chromosome gets packaged into a different particle. And that means, imagine, we're all going to a party, and instead of all going in one bus and arriving at the destination together, we all go in our own cars, and maybe some of us might get to the destination. Others doesn't, might get lost en route, especially if you don't, don't know the landscape. So this becomes a little bit more complex, but adds modularity to a system because the genomes are not fixed. And within all of these viruses that are DNA or RNA, there are certain elements that we can start seeing and observing. When you go away from sequence space, you go into protein space, you narrow down. Um, sequence space, you go down to fold space, it's much more uh, constrained. So you can have two protein sequences that are 30% divergent, yet when they fold, they are close to 90% similar in the fold space. So with that, there are viruses like this. There's a helicase domain that is shared between RNA and DNA viruses. Same thing as the single jelly roll capsid protein fold. And there are a variety of these things that we can then start building networks and evolutionary connections between some of these viruses. So when you start thinking about evolution, certainly one of the main things, which is kind of a human-made construct, is taxonomy, where we like binning things into categories and dividing them up so we can then start calling them something and referring to them in a variety of ways. And viruses are slightly different in the way we use taxonomy for them in the sense that We've got pretty much going from realm, kingdom, phylum, class, order to family. But the difference is that all the taxa names are italicized, whereas in eukaryotes, prokaryotes, all the taxa names, only the genus and the species are italicized. And this was a construct that was assembled earlier on by a virologist to distinguish between viruses 
and other elements for that reason. But nonetheless, we can take groups of viruses and start kind of studying them based on some common genes or common domains. And here is a group of viruses that we are able to study in great detail, primarily because it's got these two domains, an endonuclease domain and a helicase domain, which are essential for initiating replication. So when we look at these viruses that I just mentioned in terms of endonuclease domain and the helicase domain, um, one of the important things is that we can br bring them into a group, into a phylum, primarily because they share that domain, but also there are certain other interesting traits. They infect a variety of different organisms, the genomes are relatively small, and that's why my group for the last 20 years has focused on these viruses, because we're interested in evolution, not at a gene level or a protein level. We want the entire genome because we're also interested in the non-coding regions. And those non-coding regions become very important. And if you were to take these two domains, the helicase domain and an endonuclease domain, even though they're part of the same fixed protein, you can trim them in half, draw the phylogenies, and the phylogenies are only congruent for certain groups of viruses. They're incongruent for a variety of them. And this kind of gives us an indication that there has been recombination, a signal that we can't detect at a nucleotide level, but we can detect via phylogeny at a protein level because that signal has degraded at a nucleotide level. So this kind of gives us some level that these viruses have been recombining for a long period of time and evolving. But we can also start doing some really, really interesting stuff with these viruses. We can take the helicase domain, and we all know about helicases are very important, during replication, they're separating the two strands of nucleic acid, and helicases are also present in a variety of organisms. Now, we can start looking at these in a bipartite network. The network doesn't show that well here, but what we're seeing is we're seeing connections between a variety of these different structures here, or clades, and we notice that there are bacterial helicases that are kind of cluster with viral helicases, same with archaea, and um, bacterial, and in some cases we see viruses. And so this is kind of giving us some sort of an indication that these proteins or these domains have some evolutionary connection. And with that, can we start drawing on some important questions, which are where have viruses evolved from or where have these particular group of viruses evolved from? And our hypothesis at the moment for at least these small single-stranded DNA viruses is that they basically evolved from a plasmid-like ancestor. And then from there, they've acquired a jelly roll capsid protein and then speciated into these groups of Gemini viruses and genomoviruses that have then yielded new plasmid-like elements. And beyond that, there are other jelly roll modules that have been acquired and they have then turned into different groups of viruses. So we're studying these viruses more as a modularity. We're not thinking about it as a protein that is fixed. That protein can be acquired through mechanisms of recombination. It's not in a one cycle. This would have happened over thousands and millions of years we're thinking about. But when we look at all of these sing single-stranded DNA viruses and we look at the recombination patterns, we start seeing that the recombination hotspots are pretty much in the non-coding areas. And the coding areas are pretty much old spots of recombination. And this is not surprising because the last thing you want to do is break a coding area, makes it deleterious, maybe truncated protein. Obviously, in nature, it wouldn't be selected for. It would die off in that population. So this is kind of a trend we see. But we also have these really fascinating things going on with these bipartite viruses that have two molecules, two chromosomes packaged into two different capsids, yet they are needed for an infection. And so they get co-transmitted by vectors. And when we look at the phylogeny of the two different molecules, so you can say, think about concepts of um, the chromosomes in a variety of different types, we don't see any congruence. So that tells us these secondary molecules are just accessories that can be traded as needed, and that is a huge evolutionary advantage for segmented viruses as opposed to viruses that are not segmented where all the genomic components are fixed on a linear piece or a circular piece of nucleic acid. So that becomes kind of really, really interesting. But the other things that are really staggering are the mutation rates. These viruses, the single-stranded DNA viruses and mutation rates that are staggeringly high 
and are very similar to those of RNA viruses. And this debunks a lot of the early hypotheses that RNA viruses are more error prone or have high mutation rates because they use uh, reverse transcriptases that are error prone. And we've kind of proved that actually that's not true. DNA viruses or single-stranded DNA viruses have similar evolutionary rates. And the other thing that we start noticing in these kind of systems is that these genomes have high plasticity. And so that means that they're able to acquire, in the case here, they've basically acquired this molecule from a bipartite, fixed it in a monopartite genome, and expanded the genome size. So the capsid proteins that these viruses have are also very flexible to accommodate for increased size of nucleic acid. So important thing is that capsid proteins have a finite in a finite space in which they can encapsulate nucleic acid. As you increase the nucleic acid size, the capsid has to change or change its conformation. So these are some interesting things that we've been observing in nature. But one of the bigger questions we always had with single-stranded DNA viruses was, why are the genome single-stranded? That is really an unstable way to have the genome they form secondary structures in the capsids when they're stable. So we took all single-stranded DNA viruses available in public databases and did in, in silico folding, so minimal energy folding, to see if they form complementary structures or complex structures within themselves. And we see a lot of interaction networks. But what we start seeing is really, really interesting is that purifying selection is strongest at paired nucleotide sites. In all our short-term evolution experiments, we see that the mutations accumulate in unpaired sites. But the biggest thing that we found was a concept of covariance. And that is that if a particular site in a complementary domain, if that mutates from an A to a G, then that will mutate from a T to a C to compensate for that secondary structure and formation of those hydrogen bonds. And this was something that we'd never thought about and so that means these secondary structures are really, really important in a lot of these single-stranded DNA viruses, and that's why they're folding them back on themselves, and some of them are likely molecular switches. Okay. So kind of thinking along these lines, and we were like, okay, these viruses are really fascinating. They're single-stranded. They seem to recombine like crazy. How about we do some recombination experiments in the lab? So we took two viruses that were circulating in nature, and these are plant infecting viruses in this case. We basically, they're 10% different at a nucleotide level. So that's pretty diverse in its own way when we think about organisms, maybe primates as well. So we chopped them in half and made reciprocal chimeras. We put them into host plant. And then we thought, what could happen? They could have very, very simple recombinations, complex recombinations, could have pretty much detrimental effects of subgenomics where they lose segments of the components or the genomic elements. And if we were to take all of these, can we run fitness assays and see how fit some of these recombinants were? And we do this, we put it into a host and within 30 days in a sensitive host, they're able to find the solution that is there in nature. So basically, they're able to explore 10% sequence space and hit the optimal point through recombination in 30 days. Okay, so that is pretty amazing. But when we look at resistant varieties of these, uh, their host, we see pretty much congregation very quickly into pretty much where the optimal region is. When you look at some of the sensitive varieties, there is a bit of sequence exploration that's taking place. And that means that in resistant varieties in where the host pressure is really high, there's a high bottlenecking. Whereas in others, there is a little bit more room for exploration of sequence space. And that's where probably new variants are emerging. And in this kind of a context, we can go on to the ecosystem level and say, all right, so where do these viruses emerge from? Because they infect maize, but maize is not an African crop. It was introduced into Africa at a given time point around 1600, 15 and 1600, and why is it a major pathogen? And if we start surveying and doing a whole lot of analysis across the continent of indigenous grasses, finding related viruses, and then removing the recombination signal, taking into account mutation rates, 
we can start calibrating these nodes and we can figure out roughly around mid 1800, almost 250 years after the introduction of maize to the continent, these viruses have emerged. So it took about 250 years for the viruses in indigenous crops or indigenous plants to find the optimal landscape to hit a introduced crop. And 250 years is nothing in an evolutionary scale. So these viruses or nanoviruses are probably some of my favorite viruses, primarily because they are multi-component viruses. Each component encodes a different protein. They have a common region where one protein, in this case, the replication associated protein binds, replicates all of these molecules. This one encodes a capsid protein that encapsidates all of them, so forth. And these, we so far have been finding them in plants and they're really unique and we can't understand the modularity, but they're really, really fascinating because a variety of people have done studies on it. They can take these different components, add them at different ratios into host. They all balance back to a particular genome formula relative to each other. And you mix that up, they come back to that same thing. So there is some level at which each molecule has to be present in a particular host. And this is really, really fascinating. So we've been studying these viruses in bananas for a long time. And when we look at these things, we see high recombination rates within components that are similar. But between components, we see a recombination hotspot where the common region is. They reassort like crazy. We see lots of reassortment. But when you start doing their phylogeography, we start seeing some really, really unique patterns. That the virus has emerged in Southeast Asia around 900 and moved to the rest of the world from there. And the reason why we see this here into the Indian subcontinent, what has happened is bananas have a diversity hotspot of Papua New Guinea and Southeast Asia. From there, obviously bananas have been domesticated for a long period of time, been moved by humans around. And then around 1600, the British empire is expanding and they're moving it laborers and material from one of the colonies to a variety of their other colonies. And the reason why we see this in the Pacific island of Tonga, because Tonga is very close to Fiji, where the British took a lot of endangered labor from Southern India, as well as planting material to Fiji. And so we've got bananas from Fiji moving into Pacific island of Tonga, infected material into their other colonies of Australia and colonies in Africa. So here you have a very good example that tracks anthropogenic movements and colonization with the movement of infected material. And because bananas don't grow from seed, and that means whatever virus is in there is archived and it moves along with whatever way we move with it. So this kind of things are what we study. But moving away from plants, there are other things that kind of are detrimental, and this is a virus it's a single-stranded DNA virus again, but infects a variety of animals, a bird species and mammals, but in parrots, it has very, very severe outcomes. And that is a deformed beak, and in some cases, severe feather loss, and parrots are long-lived animals. So a sulfur-crested cockatoo can live up to 120 years. This is Cocky Bannet. This is Cocky Bannet's obituary. Cocky Bannet traveled around the world, and the last 20 years spent its life in a pub in Australia in that state, and it died, unfortunately, but it died of this virus infection, but it lived a pretty decent life. And so with this kind of things, we can start studying these viruses in different ways. And for example, here, I was called into the Pacific Island of New Caledonia to try and investigate an outbreak. And basically I'd ask the breeder, legal, illegal breeder, to send me feather samples. And feathers are really good because on the feathers, you get an archival of blood in the calamus, so you can sex the birds, there's enough genetic material to do quite a lot of forensics there. And so from there, we were able to identify all the circoviruses in that population on his um, breeding facility. And when I went to see him in New Caledonia, the first thing I asked him, have you got or bought any animals from Europe as breeding pairs to complement your stock? And he said, yes, it's like, how did you know? I said, well, these are all the viruses circulating in European facilities, these are yours. And that clearly is an indication, and right up here are what are circulating in endemic populations 
in New Caledonia in the rainbow lorikeets. So very quickly, I was able to figure these kind of things out based on this. But this is a challenge. When you go to breeding facilities, here is some of the work I've done with collaborators in Poland, and we start seeing some interesting dynamics. At breeding facilities, animals are trafficked legally and illegally from all around the world. Poor animals come in stressed, they get all thrown into one aviary, and that is just a mixing vessel for viruses. If these viruses recombine like crazy, they do. Here's an example of a genome that is 70% recombinant. So it's just de novo synthesized in its own evolutionary mechanism through recombination. And we see this virus is infecting a variety of different parrot species in these breeding facilities. So breeding facilities also act as these movements of viruses in a variety of dynamic ways. So with this, because I was working with quite a lot of um, avian work, I was doing work on parrots, but I also do work on racing pigeons because racing pigeons, the most expensive pigeon is roughly estimated at about 500,000 euros to about a million. And Poland is the main place. And obviously they succumb to disease as well. So there is a lot of effort in that area. And David Ainley kind of noticed a daily penguin chicks one season with feather loss. And the next thing, he asked me to kind of come and have a look at it and study these animals. And now 10 years later, I study penguins, not only from a virus side, but also an ecological behavioral perspective. So it's a completely different thing that's set up. But that kind of leads us into the Antarctic where we're working with all of these animals that are highlighted in red. And with that, we're discovering things, we're identifying things that we don't know anything about in this frozen continent because very little virology has been done. There's very little anthropogenic activity there other than early explorers and current researchers and tourism. So, you know, it is a very interesting place to study virology in terms of emergence. But nonetheless, uh, a couple of years ago when I was down there, we noticed one of the chicks with uh, feather deformi deformity and we did not have permits to sample the animals. So we couldn't handle them for that reason, but we could sample the nest around it. And based on the nest sampling, we were able to identify um, viruses very, very quickly that were very closely related. Here is the one in parrots. These are in uh, uh, gulls. So we can see there are avian specific circoviruses circulating. And with the British Antarctic Survey team, we actually sampled here for us in Adeli penguins and chinstrap penguins, and we were sampling here. We identified another lineage, which is about 10% different. So we're seeing these two lineages of the circoviruses on two different parts of the continent uh, circulating at the moment. And when you start looking at all of these viruses, you start finding things like crazy. And in Waddell seals, we found this really funky virus in every Waddell seal fecal sample that we were looking at. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And the more we started, digging in and looking into genomic databases, we started noticing something really interesting, that the replication associated protein that is the endonuclease and the helicase domain, there are integrated sequences related to that with a variety of frame shift mutations and deleterious mutations in a variety of cestode genomic elements. And now we can potentially say that this virus that we've been finding in Waddell seals is highly, highly likely shed from their nematodes that infect or colonize their guts. And when we look at the fecal sample, we do see heaps and heaps of nematodes in those systems. So can we start linking through these kind of mechanisms, even though it might seem like noise, can we start identifying viruses of other organisms through this indirect sampling mechanism? And certainly we don't think about viruses in protozoans much, but there are viruses that infect protozoans. And here's a whole lot of work that's been done by Cormac and Leah's group, oops, uh, Leah's group, where they've been identifying Entamoeba and Jaya infecting viruses in human fecal samples. And obviously they have decided to go with the Lord of the Ring themes theme and generated or named three families around these groups of viruses. But here in the desert, we've been kind of looking at rodent samples with uh, Mike Warabi. Um, and um, what we start noticing is we start noticing a variety of these viruses in rodents. And 
It's really interesting. We can now start parsing together that Giardia probably is circulating in rodents, and we're indirectly sampling these viruses through these things. So now we're trying to understand the ecology of where the Giardia would be coming in to contact these animals. Okay. And now we kind of start thinking about the environment and move away from a host specificity thing. What is happening in the permafrost? We're seeing a lot of melt. And in the Antarctic, there is a lot of melt, even in the dry valleys. There are these permafrost layers where there are algal mats, which are now completely exposed. And in the summer, in the austral summer, there are little river streams that run here, run into lakes. So some of the questions are, are some of these melting permafrost layers seeding ecosystems? And what are the dynamics going to be? So we kind of did a pilot project to try and look for viruses in these permafrost layers. And yes, we find viruses. Um, and we've kind of dated those as about 700 year old layers. But are these viruses viable? And here's an, a work, some work we did with um, Eric Delwart and a team of people in, um, in Northern Canada, where we basically had a ice core sample. And in the ice core sample at about 120 meters, we found these viruses and they looked at them and thought, wow, they look very similar to viruses that infect plants. So what we did is, and we dated that to about 700 years ago in this caribou feces. And so we basically, in a controlled lab at UC Davis, we basically made one of these things infectious, put it into plants. It was able to circulate and replicate very easily, no symptoms in the plant. But that kind of raises the question, if given the right environment, can viruses trapped in permafrost be viable in the current ecosystems? And so with that, we've been kind of addressing some bigger questions within glaciers. And in glaciers, you get cryoconite holes. So if you, any one of you goes onto a glacier, you will notice there will be a, wherever this debris, soil debris or dust debris that gets blown over, uh, it creates a melt pool. And in some places, it, it freezes over. And then you will see a very, very unique structure. In the Antarctic, this happens commonly, but those cryoconites get lidded over, so if a lid forms, and they do not have any external contact for up to 10 years. So the microbial communities in there are thriving for up to 10 years. And we're trying to address the question of viruses as mobile elements reshaping the community in these ecosystems. And so we've done, we've identified a variety of viruses in cryoconite holes. And these cryoconite samples are full of rotifers and tardigrades and a variety of bacteria. And so now we're now looking at microcosm experiments where we're changing nitrogen and phosphorus conditions to see if viruses are modulating and providing accessory genes for the survival of these organisms. Okay, now we go to the mysteries. Anelloviruses are a major mystery in the field of virology. People have dedicated their entire careers to studying these things. There are small DNA viruses, circular, but we don't, know if they cause disease at all. But in patients that are immunosuppressed, they are in this huge high elevated level. So we've been kind of looking at these in the context of felids a little bit. And we noticed that, you know, they come in a variety of different sizes. They cluster in different groups. And if you draw the phylogeny of the felids relative to the phylogeny of the viruses, there is some congruence, but not a lot. We see some mixing taking place. There are two clear felid groups. And in there, we see domestic animals, domestic cats. Why? Now, the domestic cats, some of them are here, some of them are there. Some of these are prey to some of these wild animals. But then we start finding indirectly evidence of predator-prey dynamics, where we're able to sample viruses that the felids might have eaten an animal, in this case, rodents. And we've recently kind of identified an entire dynamic of predator prey using virus as a proxy. And we're able to tell even which rodent species the coyote had eaten. And so this is kind of stuff that we're doing. We're beginning to use viruses as a proxy for trophic interactions in ecosystems that we do not know any of those. We can't observe those. And a lot of it has to do with co-evolution of the viruses and co-speciation of those viruses with their hosts. But the reason why I say these viruses are mysterious is we've been studying them for a while and 
we cannot find a replication module for them. We don't know who replicates them. In the genome, there's no replication module. There's only a capsid module. We can kind of model the capsid module, and it's very similar to those in circoviruses, but then there's this elongated domain that we don't know what it's doing. And we look at all of these circoviruses across the board. We see those infecting birds have very, very small domain up there. And as we increase in terms of organisms into more complex organisms, and we see larger elements. And so now our hypothesis is that, is this a mechanism of host immune dynamic where these things are changing the structures there or acquiring elements to actually fight off host immune pressures? Okay. Now, when we start thinking about viruses across the board, there are these groups of viruses that are pretty common in most humans, animals, but they don't necessarily cause disease. There are a couple of ones that are associated with carcinomas, but um, that's about it. We know very little about it in any kind of fish systems. And there were two groups, my group looking at Antarctic fish and Chris Buck's group looking at fish across different systems. And it just randomly happened we found this entire new cluster of these polyomaviruses in fish that nobody had ever discovered before. So now that begs the question, do we really understand how diverse these viruses are or even where these viruses are existing? And then me moving here to the desert, one of the bigger questions came up, seeing lots and lots of scorpions, we're like two viruses circulate in arachnids. Do we know anything about arachnids? Nope. We start sampling scorpions in our backyards, and lo and behold, we find all of these really amazing polyomaviruses, and we draw the phylogeny, and it is amazing because all the arachnid polyomavirus-like elements are down here. These are the ones we find in bark scorpion. These are from transcriptome data of Obvivus spider, where they've identified elements of it. And then here are all the fish ones, marsupial ones, nettles. The phylogeny of the viruses tracks the phylogeny of the organisms in their evolution. So can we use these kind of viruses in our host trophic interaction networks? And ultimately, our bigger questions with these kind of viruses is, where have they emerged from in the arthropods, in the avian species? Do we see some kind of recombination event that shaped new groups that have resulted in different lineages beyond that? Now, this is an area that we all know a lot more about, papillomaviruses, because we kind of studied them to a greater degree because of their role in human and animal pathology, especially with cancer. We know things like HPV 16, 6, et cetera, cause cervical cancer. And with that, and head and neck cancers as well now, um, in both males and females, we are studying these quite a lot. And here is an example of a cohort that we worked with, or we're still working with in South Africa, where we've been studying papillomaviruses. And you can see individuals, there are some individuals. And so these are the individuals here. They have multiple lineages of papillomaviruses when we actually do uh, cervical uh, analysis of the virums. But moving away from this, you start thinking about slightly different things. And Chris Buck is a crazy, uh, but really awesome, um, collaborator of mine at NIH. And at one point he got a bio in his bonnet that he's gonna buy fish off the fishmonger that comes outside NIH. He'll cut a sliver that'll go into the lab. The rest will go home for dinner. And so, and in the same time we were identifying, we were looking at fish from the Antarctic and we both kind of teamed up again. We're like, wow, we're finding all these papillomaviruses in fish samples that had never been described before. Nobody even knew papillomaviruses existed in fish. And working with Point Blue Conservation in Petaluma, they have got a lot of work in the Farallon Islands with a lot of seabirds. And that sent me a whole lot of cloacal swabs of seabirds. In the cloacal swab of one of the seabirds, we find this fish papillomavirus as well, another indirect proxy of trophic interaction because the seabirds are eating fish. There will be bits of the fish material in their cloacal swabs because of defecation. 
So we're indirectly finding these papillomaviruses through that mechanism. And we look at these papillomaviruses and their lineage, the fish ones are completely different to the ones that are circulating in mammals. And the ones in avian species are quite different and so in the reptiles. So we're seeing again, a very, very similar tracking across the board. Now, these guys are large double-stranded DNA viruses that we know a lot more about, smallpox, cowpox, because they have been detrimental to human history and evolution. But they also have a very, very interesting dynamic in the Iberian Peninsula. Number one, myxoma viruses infect rabbit's hair, so lagomorphs. But obviously the Australians use this to try to control the rabbit population in Australia and failed miserably because the rabbits developed a resistance to the myxoma. But in the Iberian Peninsula, there is this boom and bust cycle every 10 or 15 years where the virus comes in, sweeps in and hits the hares, Iberian hares, and then disappears. And we did some work a while back, well, a couple of years ago from the last outbreak. And we noticed something really interesting when we started looking at the genomes. And we noticed that there is an entire duplication of a genome segment. And that duplication is not from itself, but it has been derived from a totally unknown source. It is four genes that have been acquired through a mechanism of recombination. We have no idea who they've come from or where, but one of the genes in there, we can actually mutate and show that it changes, is responsible for host range. But basically, it's acquired a cassette of four genes, these four genes, and has changed completely the pathology and transmission dynamics. And so this is a very important to think about. And this is something that I raised during the monkeypox outbreak, is that please do not just map your reads to a non-genome because you will never ever find these kind of things, rearrangements, reassortments, or translocations. And it's very important to de novo assemble and identify these things because even though it's one gene, maybe extremely detrimental. Okay, so kind of start thinking about winding this up is where do we want to go? We are identifying viruses like crazy in all different ecosystems. My lab kind of is working across everything and anything that's on the planet. We're interested in it. But ultimately, we want to get to a stage where we want to understand the evolution of these viruses. For example, in this kind of a scenario here, we've got viruses. So this is actually a protein network tree of viruses. And what we want to see is have viruses associated with particular ecosystems co-evolved. For example, viruses that infect plants, fungi, and insects are highly likely to have co-evolved because those are in a very, very close ecological ecosystem together. Fungi are important below ground in the mycorrhiza. Insects are important for pollination and transmission of viruses. So can we start building these kind of networks and understanding virus evolution a lot better? But beyond that, have we even sampled viruses in ecosystems? And nobody knew about RNA viruses in bacteria, but now we're identifying them. Here is Yuri and Eugene's group kind of going ballistic, unraveling this entire thing in a variety of different systems, all the way from hot springs to marine ecosystems. And this kind of brings us to a situation where we are today. The Tara Oceans Project, which did transects across the oceans, in the first 200 meters water column, they've pretty much reached sequence. Um, they've sampled all the sequence space because they've kind of pretty much peaked there. You go further down 200 meters beyond that column, they're still identifying new sequences. So basically, we haven't fully sampled the uh, sequence space. We look at public databases and we throw, plot them viruses based on families, whatever you want to call them, genera, across the board. You kind of sum that together in a 10 by 10 grid. That's pretty much where we are. So 99, maybe 95% of viruses on the planet, we have no sequence information for. We do not even know what they infect, where they are, what are they doing. And so this is kind of where we are. We are trying to populate this database, but also start linking in hosts and then go back and start understanding some of the deeper evolution of these viruses across the board. So with that, um, the material that I've presented today, there are quite a lot of people involved in that work. There are a variety of people from all across the world and a variety of people in the lab who have been involved in the work that I've presented today.
And also Simona, who's one of my senior research scientists, has been pretty instrumental in kind of driving all of this work with me. Thank you. Really awesome. Thank you so much, Arvin. Does anyone have questions? Yes. So great talk, Arvin. Thank you. Um, so I'm really interested in the uh, protozoa viruses. Is anybody working on using those as a treatment? Sort of like, if, for example, like leishmaniasis, once it makes it into cartilage, the best treatment that's available in the US, it's like 30 days of chemotherapy, burns all your veins, and it's only about 80% effective. What's available in most other countries is only about 50% effective. And so I'm just interested to know what's going on there. No, but not that I know of anyone using biocontrol mechanisms. And we are finding a lot of protist viruses in our HIV cohort in South Africa. And so now we're beginning to kind of indirectly even detect a pathogen that we never thought was there just by the viruses we're detecting. And so certainly, like, if we can culture them, I can see options for therapy. That's cool, because it's now endemic in Texas. Oh, really? Uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Arvind. I have a question about, you know, uh, characterized, like, capturing trophic interactions, right? These things are so how far, how, like, many Russian dolls can you go down? Ooh. So let's see how far have, have we got. I We've probably got to two or three Russian dolls so far. We haven't been able to go. That's as far as we've looked. So like our trophic interactions are very simple at the moment. So like in the Antarctic, I can easily link viruses that are in the penguins via the skuas that predate on them. And the one the skuas also predate on the placenta of the seals. So I can find both those viruses in the skua, but not on each other across that way. And in California, we can, we've identified diets in mountain lions by viruses. We're like, okay, it's eaten a lagomorph. We can't tell which lagomorph it is, but it is probably a cottontail <laughs> um, that we can tell based on the anello virus we identify and a polyoma virus we've identified. So we're able to get to some level, but we haven't got like fully detailed. So like I, I would it would be difficult to say how many Russian dolls we can put Russian dolls we can go far. Hello, Arvind. That was a great talk. Um, if you don't know, Arvind is my professor. So uh, I have some questions that he brought up. Um, recently, it's come to my attention in like Mike two twenty, and when we're teaching the Baltimore classifications, we don't teach that there is a group of single stranded negative sense DNA viruses. But you brought up one that would be against that, um, which is Anello viridae, which are negative sense single stranded DNA viruses. Um, could you speak as to why we haven't altered that, or is this the Baltimore classification just too antiquated to go back in? At that? Yeah, so the Baltimore classification, obviously set up by David Baltimore, <laughs> um, was to kind of broadly, was a broad stroke approach for characterizing viruses or grouping viruses based on their genome organization, or at least genomic element. Now, with the single-stranded DNA viruses, they didn't see uh, any need to differentiate between positive and negative sets. And that's why they were all lumped as single-stranded DNA viruses. Whereas in RNA, they thought it was important because it was very important to dis distinguish them, given that the positive sense RNA could have a head start in replication, the negative sense had a little bit more complexity in terms of how to replicate because they would have to make a template, a copy strand, and then use that to then replicate. So that was pretty much the main thing. Um, and if I may continue a secondary question about anello viruses, um, yeah, I thought, well, it was my understanding that anello viruses don't typically cause any symptoms and have been like labeled as commensal viruses. But it was brought to my attention that there is an anello virus that is part of gyroviruses that causes anemia in avian, so chicken anemia virus. Is there, has anyone investigated what are some of the differences? Because anello viruses are really small. Um, like you said, they encode very little and they don't have a cap, uh, replication protein. So we're seeing in like humans and like other, um, other organisms that they don't cause any um, 
symptoms, but now we have one that does. Is there some kind of variation that we're not really investigating as to why this one causes? Yeah, so it probably goes back to the structure that we did of the gyroviruses. And then in the gyroviruses, you notice there is a very clear trend that the the P domain is relatively small, sorry, um, compared to all of the others. And so here you've got, here are pretty much, you're looking at the gyroviruses, sorry, gyroviruses are gonna be sitting here. And basically what you've got is you've got a very, very small uh, domain of that. And that is kind of one of the main reasons we're not. So we think that this immune, this is an immune modulator somewhere um, in the gyroviruses. And it's only seen in chickens where the chicken anemia virus is associated with and might be some really weird co-infection that might be causing the secondary element because it will need someone to replicate it and it might be that secondary infection. All right, thank you. Hello, um, I really loved your talk, thank you. Um, so I guess you had said that um, you know we can use these viruses as um, a, a proxy for you know understanding the trophic interactions um, and ecosystems they know don't know much about. So do you have any interest in going into the deep sea and and uh, trying to see some trophic interactions down there? Or has anyone come to you? Um, no, nobody has come to me to address that. But there are people already doing quite a lot of work in the deep sea. So especially with the sulfur um, bacteria as well as the worms. And so there, there is a Japanese team that's doing a lot of work and they've found really interesting viruses associated in that ecosystem down there. And so again, most of those viruses in those hot, hot vent areas are gonna be likely double-stranded DNA viruses, just with high GC content, just what we'll find similar to what we'll find in say Yellowstone or any of the hot springs. But there are there are people who are doing a lot of deep ocean work. Cool, thanks. Thanks, yeah, great overview of a lot of those families. Um, apologize for a, a naive question because I'm not a virologist at all, but a number of years ago, I, I uh, think it was a radio lab podcast about megaviruses. Um, can you say something about them or how that story is developing? I understand that they were protected maybe because of the methods we used to Viruses. Yeah, certainly. So the megaviruses are these giant viruses that have been discovered thanks to the cooling towers in Bradford, and they infect amoeba. And so the French scientists and British scientists at that stage found these things. Initially, there was one group called mimiviruses, and now we're finding mammaviruses, Sputnik, we're finding virophages, so viruses that infect other um, giant viruses. Um, and so uh, these viruses are kind of unique because people have suggested they're probably the fourth domain of life. I disagree. But their genetic elements are really funky because they have hijacked genes from prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And so when it comes to bioinformatics and you find these type of viruses, you get into this really, really odd, twisty environment where your gene callers have to account for prokaryotic genes and eukaryotic genes. And in some cases, we're finding overprinting as well. And so now we're having to develop completely new codes. So now there's Proca GV, Proca giant virus that has been written to mainly address these giant viruses that infect. So far, we've noticed they infect protists. And there are lots and lots of them, really beautiful morphology. And if you push um, so the optics on a light microscope, you might just see them, okay? And so they're, they're about 500, 600 nanometers plus with the fibers. They, they just, in, in high resolution microscopes, you can just make them out. You can't see the details, but you might just push the limit. And yeah, they're funky. They're really interesting. Um, and we've kind of dwelling in it thanks to Vim, uh, because of the ponds, uh, the algal ponds, people are interested in green energy and the algal ponds have been crashing because there's an amoeba that is eating the cyanobacteria. And we were asked to see if we can identify any amoeba infecting virus that could be used as a biocontrol. And so we have a whole lot of pond samples that we've looked at and yes, we found a virus 
a giant virus in there, but I haven't fully characterized it. I've done, it, they're about one to two megabases in genome size, and we've got uh, the genome assembled for about three quarters of it. And so I'm busy trying to tackle that. Hi, uh, lovely presentation. Very much enjoyed. I did have a quick question I have for clarification. When you talked about recombination genomics and how some viruses are able to expand their uh, their genes by taking in different uh, different strands and like adding it to their, their capsids are able to grow in order to adjust for this. Is there certain types of capsids that are like particular viruses with specific capsids that are more likely to expand? You know, adopt this method of expanding their genome, like have to be the difference between like spiral and ectosophedral. And is there a reason for that, or have you noticed? Yeah, that? certainly. So the capsid proteins of viruses obviously protect the nucleic acid. So with RNA viruses, which are helical, the capsid protein interacts with the DNA of the RNA. So as the size of the genome increases, obviously the capsid proteins will surround more of it. There's a non-specific interaction there. So if you increase the size of an RNA virus, the length of the capsid will increase in that way. But a lot of capsid proteins don't have that much flexibility. So they will have a threshold of packaging X amount of nucleic acid. For example, papillomaviruses, when I was designing vaccines for papillomaviruses, so I used to express the capsid protein recombinantly. When I assembled them, it would randomly package nucleic acid that was four to six kilobases, which is the size of papillomavirus genomes are six to eight KB. So there is a, a threshold at which it can encapsulate material. And some capsids have a lot more flexibility than others. And so again, we're still kind of figuring out the capsid sequence space and its dynamics. What are the giant viruses use? So they've got capsid proteins, but they also got envelopes and like they're messy because they bud out of the amoeba and just, and so they take a bit of the envelope of the amoeba with it. Yes. How deep into the Antarctic permafrost are you all sampled? Because I'm assuming like, the further you go, I'm, there's a, probably a wealth of information Historic, historically about paleoecology that you could go back and kind of uncover the deeper you go. So I, I don't know. I haven't gone that far, but if you really want to know a little bit more about it, um, the Salsa Project, there's a Netflix and an Amazon Prime documentary. So the Salsa Project um, is a project out of Montana State University. They went and drilled about a kilometer down into a sub Antarctic lake and the dynamics of how they had to do that and take the core samples from there. They find a lot of microbial communities. I wouldn't be surprised they'll find viruses, but I don't think they're looking for viruses. But it, I wouldn't be surprised it's full of bacteriophages. That's about time, thank you so much, Arvind. Oh, thank you.